Sure, you can go ahead and share. All right, welcome everyone to this afternoon's educational session brought to you by the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, or ANAXL, sponsored by VR Patients. Today's presentation is titled Assessment Findings Beyond Shortages to Integrated Learning. My name is Regina Camacho from the ANAXL National Office, and I'll be serving as today's moderator. Our presenters for today's session are Devin Marble and Martha Levine from VR Patients. Um, and I will now be turning this presentation over to our speakers. Well, thank you, Regina. It's a pleasure for uh, for us to be here with everybody. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Devin. I am a I have a bachelor's of science. I am a VR educator, and I work for VR patients. Do all the marketing stuff. My name is Martha Levine. I have a PhD in nursing, a master's in nursing education, and my role at VR patients is I'm the director of nursing innovation and curriculum integration. And my background is I've done a lot of education, both as a nursing faculty member and as a director of nurse residency programs for a hospital enterprise. So I see that a lot of the attendees are still starting to roll in, which is perfect. It's a perfect timing, guys, because what we're going to do right now is we're going to start to kick this off with revealing the assessment findings. So I'm going to tell you a brief story of how this all began, we were at an Axel and I got acquainted with the Axel president and the executive director and Scott over at that company. And it was just um, at Smith Bucklin. And it was such a wonderful handshake that we decided to collaborate on a needs assessment. And the goal was to find out what the biggest challenges in clinical education were for the end user, for you, edu clinical educators. And so uh, we made it anonymous. We wanted to know what your title was. And then the answer to the question, what is your biggest challenge in clinical education? So today our objectives are to reveal the results to you, show you what people are saying. Then we're going to have a little discussion about how to effectively integrate VR into a nursing curriculum, especially when you're short staffed. Like that's kind of the key differentiator there. That's, you're going to see that as like a theme going forward. People feel it. They're short-staffed. And then we're going to talk about some innovative solutions that address time constraints and shortages for clinical educators. And please forgive my voice. I'm getting over a cold that my kids gave me, but I still love them. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> so the question asked, what is your role or title? And at your organization or institution, what is your biggest challenge in clinical education? We had 78 nurse educators voice their challenges, and this is the whole pie, folks. Take a brief moment just to glance at what we're looking at here. If you kind of look around it, this is a average of 78 responses, which were relatively detailed. People were writing sentences about their challenges. And so we distilled, oh, this sentence is about space and lack of clinical sites. And this sentence is about challenges and standardization. If you look at this, more than 50% of the pie is taken up by staffing, student faculty buy-in, and time, time bandwidth issues. That doesn't even include space and lack of clinical sites. If you just take that staffing and student faculty buy-in, I mean, you that's the majority of the problems. And these that's not to say that these small pie pieces are not important. Funding, standardization, especially in virtual reality education or immersive solutions, we want standards. But it's not that they're not important. It's that you all are feeling this together more. But there are still problems with placements, equipment, technology, management, keeping current with things. I love this one, time to focus on content. This one was about really wanting to drill down with students and having time. They're so bogged down with so many other things. They have all of this tech and all of this uh, simulation center. And they're short-staffed and they're short on time. They don't have time to focus with their students when they want to drill down. So you can also see some cross here, time and bandwidth and time to focus kind of go together. I'm going to read you a couple of very specific ones. Our biggest challenge right now is getting qualified clinical field specialists to assist with simulation days. Sometimes it's difficult to recruit for simulation days as many seem to be intimidated by technology. That was an assistant professor. 
The biggest challenge is moving faculty from course to course rather than allowing them to continue teaching in courses they are better suited to teach. Just putting faculty somewhere to cover the teaching gap or class. I felt that. So my lesson that I always taught um, when because I'm adjunct faculty at the at our community college was special populations. So all of like the LVADs and elder care and um, special needs kids and ports and stuff like that at, at home care. That was the course that I was always teaching. And I would get tossed into the course that I had to teach like the sodium potassium pump. And it just wasn't my game, man. And that was a real challenge for me. So I feel this one personally. Another one, enough bandwidth, institutional support, and dedicated time to implement simulation properly. Another assistant professor. The last one, clinical judgment and clinical reasoning. I really like this one. It's like back to basics, the core foundation. Taking what you know and applying it in a meaningful way instead of just going through the motions. <clears throat> Whoops, I jumped ahead too fast. <laughs> So I'm going to go into a little bit more depth and detail. And so what I'd like you to do is I want you to get out your phones and get ready. You might want to take a snapshot, a screenshot of the slide so you can have this to remember all the things that we heard from nurse educators, clinical educators such as yourselves and what their challenges were. So are you ready? We're going to go switch slides in three, <laughs> two, one. Get off Facebook. <laughs> See, you book. weren't ready. Yeah. We were going to surprise you. Uh, this is actually a picture of one of my parrots. I have a parrot rescue. I have um, 10 birds currently. And my 14-year-old kiddo actually was in a uh, class and did this as part of their art class in Photoshop. So so just but kidding. So now, yes, now that everyone's off Facebook and we can, and we can go, we'll give you the next slide, which has got all the goods on it. So, go so ahead, seriously, Kevin. folks, uh, our wonderful PhD uh, nurse, director of innovation, learning and Implement implementation. I'm sure there are many more words to her title. She distilled, she went through all of this data and pulled out what like the top highlights are. So we're gonna show you some more survey response results. Um, so you might wanna pull out your phones for this one for realsies. So here we go. So keeping in mind that nurse educators, one of the things in my role that I find really important is, is I know from my experiences what I struggled with and the things that I ch were ch was challenged with as a clinical educator, both in the nursing school pre-licensure setting as well as in a hospital setting. And so I wanted to make sure that the, we really we really nailed it. We wanted to hear your voices and find out what you were uh, concerned with. So the things that we heard is that faculty are under a lot of pressure right now. There's a lot of pressure that we are trying to get as many nurses as we possibly can through nursing school. We have a nursing shortage. We've heard the, the dire warnings that we have a third potentially of nurses want to leave the bedside and want to exit practice. Uh, we're hearing that nurses aren't prepared when they graduate from nursing school. We're, we've changed the NCLEX because we are concerned that clinical judgment is not being well taught and that people come out of nursing school with not having an adequate uh, knowledge of nursing clinical judgment. Um, in addition, we we are committed as a as a discipline, as a profession, that we want to have a diverse student body. We want to have a diverse population of nurses. We want our nurses to represent the people that they're caring for. Well, sometimes as we're adding in some of our diverse student population, Sometimes that means that we don't have students that that have as equitable access, that have had as much access to certain educational resources. And so there are students who might need some additional support. We are hearing tons and tons from faculty and from people like you that the availability of clinical sites is a major problem. There's a lot of pressure on clinical sites. So there are fewer hands-on patient experiences for, for students, which results in nursing schools, licensure programs, having to rely on simulation in order to meet those clinical hour requirements. And that is requiring more and more effort on the part of nursing faculty to achieve that need. And yet the mannequins and the way that we're currently simulating seems to not fully be meeting that need. And the last thing that we heard loud and clear is that we love live simulation. It's an excellent teaching modality. We all agree 
that it is a the fantastic way to learn some of these skills to be able to do that applied learning. But there are a lot of resources required. So there are an intensive amount of budget resources, you know, from the physical space. Not all schools have the same ability to have physical space or to be able to afford equipment, the consumables, and then maintaining the equipment and keeping everyone up to date and keeping um, the high fidelity mannequins in the best condition, et cetera. And then nursing faculty also need training. They need to understand how to use the technology, how to adjust the technology and be able to, to properly simulate correctly using best in axle best practices. And we also can't repeat simulations. It's sort of a one and done. A student only gets to go through a simulation one time. And often that helps, uh, that prevents students from really being able to, to apply what they just learned from doing a simulation. And probably the biggest resource is faculty. And so we're gonna cover that on this next slide. Yeah, um, faculty gets its own slide. It was too yeah. much. Too much to put on on this. Yeah. So we know that faculty need tools. You need as many tools in your tool belt as you possibly can. There are not enough faculty. You don't have enough time, enough training, enough equipment. You're, so many resources are lacking. Faculty are struggling to try to assess students individually and work on practicing teaching those, those clinical judgment skills, trying to build that foundation of, of the nursing model of how to think and how to perform clinical judgment actions. And while we have tech and we have this amazing high fidelity things that we can use and they can be fabulous, there's a lot of things that we can use them for. However, there are still things that that we have to be able to have a foundation for in order to get started before we can do high fidelity mannequins that are bleeding and crying and and those sorts of things. We need to have a firm foundation. Yeah, we always called that back to basics. Yes. Right? We really exactly. need to get back to the core things that make you a solid nurse. Mm -hmm. um, all of the skills and physical skills are super important, but let's get back to basics. Yeah. Next slide, sorry. Go ahead, yeah, no worries. So considering that faculty are struggling and they just don't have the resources that they need, how do you integrate VR? How do you integrate simulation? How do you sim uh, integrate that foundation of clinical judgment when you just don't have the resources that you need? And again, we've got a lot of fantastic technology. You know, you can get into VR and you can practice you know, using the controllers to start IVs and place Foley catheters. But I question, and it sounds like many of you also question, is that really, is that going to help? Is that going to move the needle on those demands and those things that nursing faculty and clinical educators are being asked to do? Yeah, you know, technology is great. But you have to lead with that strong foundation. So I, I just want to take a brief moment to pause because we put up there Number one is staffing on purpose. Staffing is connected to almost everything on that pie previously. And, and in the nursing needs assessment, that's what you guys were telling us. That's what you guys were writing. You're saying there's just not enough boots on the ground to get done what's required. And I am exhausted. And you know what? That affects students' success. It, it affects the students' joy in class. The one-on-one -on -one time they get with faculty, so much. Now, Pretty soon, we're going to ask if there's someone in this audience who wants to come on stage with us and play a little game and try something. So I just wanted to prep you. We're looking for a nurse educator, a clinical educator, a clinical professor, professor who wants to play ball with us. And now I'm going to get it, the mic back to Martha. Tell us about getting back to basics. You know, skills and virtual reality aside, what's the core you're the nurse PhD, not me. I'm just Mr. Talking Head marketing guy. So tell us about, tell me about the core of clinical education. You know, we, we've we had this call back to basics. There's been, you know, ever since this, this clinical judgment model came out, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing clinical judgment model, 
was was described and initially research was done because we were concerned because there was a concern and a call to action that when nurses graduated from nursing school they they might have uh the abilities to do the things that they need to do but there were some some areas noted that there were weaknesses and so we really wanted to get to the foundation of how do nurses become nurses how do you really focus on the things that are important as a nurse and what are the things that keep patients safe and that provide the best patient quality of patient care so I want you all to take a look at this. You've probably seen this model before, but take a really, really close look. And I'm gonna ask you one question. So that question is, where do you see skills in this model? Is skills at the very top at layer zero? No, skills are down in layer four. And the reason for that is it's all the skills that you need are up here in the brain, in those nursing clinical decisions. These are the things that save people's lives. These are the things that help patients survive when they are subtly declining and nurses are able to pick up on those cues and take action and then affect outcomes. It's not about the hands-on skills. It's not about, can you use the VR controllers to put in the IV correctly? That's not important. That kind of stuff is appropriate to do in live simulation on task trainers. Those hands-on skills are not what's important when you're doing clinical judgment development in VR, which is what we're talking about today. Yeah, it's this skill right here. Right. I almost I didn't think about this until right now, but I almost saw this as like a map of the brain. Right. And way down there in the corner is like this little spot for like the mandula oblongata or something like that. Right. And everything else is the left and right and frontal lobe in the ponds and all of that. And that's where we're making our clinical decisions. I'm sure I got that all incorrect, but it just made me think of a map of the mind. So let's uh, let's translate this then. We are hearing all about staffing shortages, time constraints, issues. And there are tons of immersive solutions available to you, but you don't want to waste time in anything. It's so valuable. So what your students are simulating needs to make them better at being a nurse. You already have a simulation center to help out with their physical skills. And there's no need to replace or exchange or trade that out. It's practice tried and true. But what's really important are these nurses that start on day one and they're clinically ready to make good judgments. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some innovations that VR Patients is doing for that exact purpose. We know in all VR, you can do immersive learning environments, you can do risk-free practice, you can increase engagement and retention, like risk-free practice. Oh, I killed the patient in, it, in VR. That's okay. Hawthorne's fine. He'll be back when you reload. But some really important things, asynchronous. That's such a powerful word because it means that your students are doing something while you're having lunch or while you're grading papers or while you're having one-on-one -on -one drill down time with a student because your students, your other students are simulating in an asynchronous siloed environment. It's either in VR or it's on the laptop. There you go. It's got to be accessible. It's got to be convenient for students. All they do is log in, open up the laptop, and they're in. If they get sick in VR, it's okay. Use the laptop. They come in, they check out a headset, and they go extracurricular outside of class. And they are creating like a body of work. Now your students have a portfolio of immersive simulation work. So when it's time to drill down on them and just to sit down with them, and you're in that physical skills environment, they have a body of work that you've been tracking and analyzing and they can speak to clinical judgment because that's what they've been training on asynchronously when they come in and they're practicing their team leadership and codes or they're practicing bedside manner or they're practicing IV skills or CPR or bagging a patient or adjusting your ventilators. Objectively assessing students is another feature in VR patients that's extremely important. You need to be confident that when your student is asynchronous off on their own and they're doing something, 
that it is being you know checked, tracked, or maybe possibly graded, but in an in an objective way. Like there's it's formative and could be summative, but there's no subjectivity to it. It is you either completed it, meeting all of the clinical decision making skills that are required to get to the other end of the simulation, or you didn't. And if you didn't, it's okay. Do it again. That's the purpose. And you don't want students. I skipped over customize your scenarios. You don't. No one scenario is going to fit your curriculum. No 10, no 20, no 200. Because the body, the human body is different every single day. You guys are all probably, most of you are probably working nurses and your adjunct faculty and you're teaching. And so you have lived experiences that you're bringing into class. You should be able to simulate that in an immersive environment asynchronously. Your students should be able to learn from your wisdom and continue to learn from your wisdom. So if you customize a scenario, it's not just about changing the scene. It's about creating a digital investment. You have customized the scenario and it's, it's now added to your library and it lives on. If you have turnover, staffing problems, staffing shortages, if you have turnover at your institution, that person who built that simulation, it stays, that simulation stays there and continues to run. And the virtual avatars can teach your students how to navigate the system. That helps with the technology gap of instructors or students not knowing how to use the technology. Because a mannequin can't tell you how to use me, right? But a virtual patient can. And, and another thing I'd mention, ahead, Devin, um, is that with the VR patients platform, it, it is truly asynchronous. Students can practice on their own. You don't need to have a proctor in the headset with them. This is something they can do completely independently. You can adjust the scenarios based on uh, complexity and and what levels of uh, critical development, critical thinking that they're at, which is And that's fantastic. not to say that it's only asynchronous. You know, you certainly can right. True. live right. cast. Um, it's kind of the purpose of it, right, is that you allow students to sim, make every day a sim day, and practice in, in this risk-free environment and then they come in for when it counts right you're going to do a sim today on sim day and now think about how to integrate that which is that's what we're going to talk about next is integration and implementation of this type of technology into an existing curriculum you don't bend your curriculum to meet the technology the technology needs to bend to meet your curriculum you are good at teaching nurses you're just short-staffed you're just strapped so you need a better tool to help you out yeah. so the idea that your students can be on their own ambitiously doing something. And then when they come in, they're going to do a simulation and it counts and they get two or three tries. Now in your sim day, you only have to squeeze in one or two virtual reality simulations. It doesn't have to be all about the VR simulation all day and ignore all of the other expensive equipment that you have in your facility. It can now be sprinkled throughout your curriculum because your students, while you're teaching anatomy and physiology or conduction or disease processes or adenosine triphosphate, you know, while you're teaching these things, your students are simming in a non-destructive environment. And it is a part of their curriculum. When they come in for sim day, it's no longer about the technology either. The wow factor is gone. Uh, VR is very cool. But it needs to not be so cool when the student comes to learn because you're here to learn about the patient. So get over the technology. It needs to be an old hat. Invisible. Now, before, yes, invisible. It fades into the background. Now, before we go on to the next slide where we're going to talk about how do you do this in a curriculum, um, I want to tell you I really do want a volunteer. <laughs> so is there anybody in the audience, a clinical educator, and I've been like scoping through the attendees. I'm looking at maybe a Joanna Willett or a Cara Caracovino or Melissa Morris. Any one of you guys interested in coming on and being a panelist with us and playing a little bit. And we're going to show you something. We're going to let you make decisions. That's it. You just need to tell us what you want to build in a virtual reality simulation. And we will let you do it. And I'll be the hands. So that way you don't have to learn anything new. So think about it. Please hit us in the chat and we will promote somebody. The panelist. Now, I'm going to toss the mic over to, or I have to do the next slide, don't I? The next slide. <clears throat> don't tell Ohio State that I went snooping around their website and downloaded their nursing curriculum and used it as an example. And so now I'm going to toss the mic back to Martha. 
What are we looking at here, Martha? So what we did was using Ohio State, because the Ohio State University is very well-respected and well-renowned as, as an excellent nursing school, I wanted to do a demonstration of ways that you could sort of sprinkle these cases, sprinkle VR patients' cases throughout their uh, curriculum. So we took their exact curriculum and tried to come up with uh, and came up with some really great suggestions for things. So the one I'm going to use for the example with Devin today that we're going to talk about is we're in foundations of nursing. Uh, and so, you know, it's that foundational knowledge. It's that early, you know, and, and people might wonder how how on earth am I going to teach anything to foundational nursing students that that isn't overwhelming to them. Simulation tends to be very overwhelming. It's something that often we think of as being done only in the last few years or semesters of nursing school uh, as being a more of a high stakes or, uh, you know, a, kind of a bigger deal. And so what we wanted to do was demonstrate a way that in a foundations class, you could use a patient scenario a patient that's having some respiratory difficulty, and you could actually use that scenario in VR to actually practice some of the skills that you would be learning in a foundational nursing knowledge class. So Devin, I believe, is going to open up the platform, and we're going to give you an example of how to do that and how you could actually do that within uh, the you, authoring tool. Are we talking to foundational knowledge right now? Yeah, we're talking about, this is your very first nursing class, Devin. It's the one where you're just figuring out how on God's green earth do I take vital signs? How do I talk to a patient? How do I ask someone a question about their health history? Just totally basic nursing knowledge and skills. All right. And we have a volunteer. Melissa volunteered. So stay Yay, tuned Melissa. because we're going to have one of you guys come up to stage with us. That's so awesome. All right. <clears throat> So I actually asked Martha this. I was like, what could a foundational nurse, I didn't go to nursing school, what what would a foundational nurse get out of an immersive clinical simulation? Now, we're not going to show you this in virtual reality because we're all on a computer. Um, so in this simulation, it's web-based. And uh, you could be putting on your headset right now and walking around the patient, walking up to them and listening to the lung sounds and stuff. But instead, it's going to be with our mouse. And so I asked Martha, what is it that, what would we benefit from early in the education? I'm just getting introduced to nursing. So um, I'll start playing this in just a moment. Why don't you help me out here? What would we learn in a foundational foundational class that doesn't typically get simulation yet? Right. So, you know, I, I know that one of the main things that people are learning is how to do those head-to-toe assessments. And one of the things that's always challenging for new nurses is a nursing students listening to lung sounds. So if you were going to, we're going to take a patient that is, you know, has some respiratory difficulty going on, and we're going to want to do a more focused assessment on that patient. So Devin's going to use the stethoscope and he's listening to the different lung fields. And you can hear how they're different. Now, what we're not really showing you guys here is we built this patient before we came on camera. And so I added in ronchi, squawk, pleural friction, um, low airflow wheezes. So in theory, there's that strider up top. And all of these sounds are real patient lung sounds from USC. And so suddenly what we can do is a sign, look at you can see this case only got five minutes total. So suddenly these early students are engaging in patient assessment in a non-destructive environment. There's no stakes. It's just you're just now learning about the lung, the conversion of air and oxygen and CO2. And you you're learning the definitions of wrong guy and you get the opportunity to listen to it. And so I can come into the system as a nurse educator. And I can choose the lung sounds. And I can say, I actually, we're going to focus on the main lobes and we're going to focus on wheeze or plural rub. 
or we're going to do heart tones. That's a tough one because heart tones are really hard to pick up. So we're going to start with rumble and we want our nursing students, you know, do some rumble, just listen to it, get the, get a taste for it. And we're going to switch it up to um, normal split S1 sounds and all these things that are probably learning in their cardiology chapter. And it's a click and I'm going to come in here and do, we're going to do wheeze on the, on the right and wheeze on the left because we're just going to focus on wheeze done and now it's it's in that's now coded in vr it's coded in in webgl and vr already and now we can deploy asynchronously no stakes a body of work that is tied <clears throat> excuse me that is tied to the student login so you can see the body of work every time how many times they've been in simulation how how long they spent on it were they successful? Were they not? It, it's okay if they weren't. It's the purpose is to fail in school, right? And so let's just see what the wheezes sound like now because I switched it out. This was like wrong kind of left. And now it's just wheeze. And of course, there's quite a bit of other things that you can do in the system. And you want to do something like pen light and get see really good pupil dilation or something like that. You can I think, practice listening to all different lobes yeah. in front and back and see what those sound like and how those are different from actual true lung sounds. So help me understand this as someone who didn't go through nursing school, Martha, this entry level introductory nurse, when this is an extremely powerful platform that's intended to do physiologic responses to medication administration, like that's not year one. So what would those students benefit? How, like, how would they benefit from seeing or hearing this type of just entry level? It's three minutes, pop in and do this one thing and check it out. Mm -hmm. The, you know, I really go back to that clinical judgment model, right? Where you can actually start implementing some of those things. You come into the patient room and you're starting with those recognizing cues, analyzing cues, developing a hypothesis, you know, understanding uh, okay, so I listened to these lung sounds. Uh, things sounded different in different lobes. What does that What does that mean? Does that mean uh, that you know, from from a patient's perspective, from the assessment perspective, how do you then take that knowledge and that uh, the things that you've cues that you've seen, and then apply them to try to make a difference, or you know, to just really start developing those those skills of the clinical judgment model. You can do that at a very, very basic level. You know, it can even, it could be dialogue. It could be something where it's as simple as asking people how they're feeling, uh, taking a history or using, you know, did they do the correct assessment? You know, right. if someone's complaining of a headache, did they, did they, you know, hone in on something that maybe was wildly inappropriate, like they right. were going down the suicide scale or who knows, you know, it allows them to really kind of fully immerse themselves in the entire situation as a nurse. I can't breathe very well. I need my inhaler. So I think we're at a interesting little point here where we might be able to we wanted to save time for questions and stuff and for the polls, but we might be able to bring someone on coming up on stage. So, uh, Melissa, if you are still ready, would love for you to come on stage and have a chat with us. Also, Regina, were you able to uh, distribute the polls to the to the crowd? <laughs> sure. Do you want me to start the first one with them? Yeah, yeah, I think you'd throw one on. Oh, yes, our first poll. Hi, Melissa. Love the virtual avatar. Well done. <laughs> Brilliant. How's it going? It's going <clears throat> very well. Um, okay, so this is going to be really easy. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you just for a traditional, typical simulation right think of uh, maybe one that you have done recently with some students but mm -hmm. i just want you to to i want you to basically injure the patient and we're going to run it in a sim and see how it works so let's say that you um can you name just like 
a general simulation? Like what's one that you have done recently or, or that you know of? Like a, an 80 year old female um, who just had like a fem pop and is coming in with green oozing. What's a, what's a fem site. pop? What's a fem pop? Um, you have to excuse me. Uh, femoral popliteal, like, you know, she just had a, oh. a vein okay, so let's, removed well, and put in her. Gotcha. So this would be like an infection site or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. An infection. All right. Great. Let's try this. <laughs> then. So what we're going to do here is there are Sims that come with the system. The, di and... the diabetic would be fine. Oh, Make diabetic. her diabetic. Add, add that on to a diabetic. Okay, great. Let's see. Diabetic. Where Did you I, see it? I don't see it. Yeah, oh, I just is. did. Okay, perfect. There's nursing diabetic, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's Hawthorne. So we're going to duplicate this right now. We're going to call this Melissa. Uh, infection. That's actually great, right? Because if they're diabetic and they have an infection, they are going to be harder to heal. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to quick refresh. And we're going to see our, where's, there she is, Melissa infection. I'm going to edit this. So you wanted a, something like an 80-year-old female. I think we can use Cheryl for this. There she is. Beautiful. Would you like to be in a hospital or do you want to be like social determinants of her health and be in her house? Ooh, that's interesting. I usually do it in a hospital, but let's put her in sure. the house. You want to do something in the house? You got a dining room or you could do like the bedroom or we could do- uh, Let's put her in room. her- Let's do her in her living room. Oh, living room. Okay, great. So now we're in her living room. So maybe you're maybe you're doing uh, oh. you're, you're going to train your students on social determinants of health, right? And so you can start them out in the living room if you'd like to end them in the clinic or in the emergency department. You can. Yeah, let's so, end them in, end them in the ER. Perfect. And this is going to be a twenty five minute. Let's make it shorter. Let's do just fifteen minutes in this case. You know, it takes a long. You get in VR, it's like uh, it's a lot. Um, your eyes get you know, warm and stuff like that and sweaty. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time changing the dialogue. So it says, this is, this is Hawthorne, but, um, Davy, right. My, my mom calls me Davy. So we would want to come in here and fix the dialogue, which you just type and change. So that way it meets the age of the woman and the fact mm -hmm. that she has an infection. So, but we're going to go to the patient conditions and we're going to do some quick surface level stuff. So you said that she has an infection and mm -hmm. um, we have this, um, we have like a little abrasion here. So this would be like an yeah. open wound, right? Yeah. But maybe we want to do, if you're doing going with infection, so there's edema. So we could do like edema in her ankles. Yes. Uh, you want to do that? Let's do that. Let's put edema in her ankles because maybe, where did it go? Was it in the, was it only here? There it is. Okay, we'll give her some severe edema. When I click on it in blue and done, that is now, that's in, it's in VR. But you also said popliteal, which I'm guessing is like right behind the leg, right? Yeah, right so behind the leg, the knee. Lower left. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I can put it on the rear, but let's do a burn because a burn looks like an infection. So like this looks like an infection. I um, mean, that's really what we're going for here, right? Sure, We're going for sure. something that looks like if you were to pull off that dressing and go, oh, honey. Yeah, unless you have like a surgical incision that's infected, that's more of what I was looking for. Yeah. There's uh, surgical, ooh, surgical incision. incision. Yeah. I've got um let's see here. Let's see. We've got some lacerations here that is the same thing as a as an incision, right? So let's see here. There's that guy. That doesn't look really clean though. It's not very infected or anything. Um, but we can make it bad. You know what I mean? Okay. okay. And then early um, stages. anything else? Yeah, early stages for sure. And then and you can put that on the back. Uh, I don't know if it's on the rear right now. That one, it looks like it's surrounding, and those lacerations were not on the rear. They were only on the front. So I'm not sure we can put that on the rear at this point. Let's see here. Yeah. We don't need the edema. Um, okay. Perfect. But you could. But we can get, can we give her like a, we're going to give her a cough. And oh, that's a great idea. Let's give her a cough. So she's coughing. And we're mm -hmm. going to have her cough, you know, frequently. So how about every two seconds? She's going to cough. Mm -hmm. And then does she have any like heart? She's old, right? Anything wrong with her heart? She good? She's paced or what's going on with her? No, she's, she's going to be, let's make her a little, uh, no, let's keep her regular. Regular. Okay, great. Because again, again, more. you know, you were talking more here about um, foundation students. Yeah. Um, yeah and one absolutely. of the things. 
one thing that I really like are what I call mundane simulations, things that you see kind of every day where people right. are kind of like normal, but let's just put her in a first degree block then. Cause that's like, you wouldn't do anything about that anyways. Yeah. And she's old. Yep. She's probably got something like that going on. It's no big deal. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So other than that, if this little checkbox is checked, that means that the controller will vibrate to the pulse that we have set at 109. And then mm -hmm. how's her lungs? Is she okay? Is she normal? Is there anything you want to put in there? Um, let's give her like some crackles on like in her base. Oh, okay, great. If we're going to do bases, we're going to do nine, uh, seven and 10 on the rear. We can give her some fine crackles. How about that? Seven. Sounds good. And low flow crackles on that one. And then we'll do it on the front just to, well, we're good. We'll just do it on the rear. Okay, cool. All right. So as you can see now, we are really creating a completely new patient that doesn't exist today. And we duplicated it. So you had a certain number of patients in your patient library that your students were simming on, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's say it was 20. Well, we just made 21. And now right. if I hit run, it's going to run. We're now, we just did it. And we're going to be able to see these things. This is what I call a digital investment. Now, part of the digital investment is takes longer than this. It's more than just surface level stuff. It's going in and making physiologic changes to if a student gives an incorrect treatment, a correct treatment, or waits too long to assess something, and you want to put timers in there, right? So you can, you can do that. And I'm going to show you what I mean by digital investment if you sit and you spend time on that logic. And Martha, what did someone recently say to us about what the logic looks like. Oh, there's her cough. Do you remember what they called it? They said that logic Gosh. looks interesting. It reminds me of nursing logic, like flow, logic flow. But anyways. Like uh, care plan logic or? I can't remember, but I'll, I'll come up with it. So maps. here she is. We are in her mm -hmm. living room. If you were in VR, you could walk around her and mm -hmm. you've got 15 minutes. And you may want to uh, remove her upper and lower clothes and find these injuries that we have placed on her leg. That is insanely bad laceration. <laughs> Holy moly. Right. And she's got this little infection going on down here. And it right. looks like she's actually a little bit sweaty too. Uh, if you see mm -hmm. a little glisten, we have a yeah. WYSIWYG system, which means what you see is what you get. So if you see shiny, that's a thing. You have to address mm -hmm. that. Um, and then we can pop in here and start, start assessing this person, get the stethoscope going. Oh, you put it on the, we put it on the rear lobes. There's those crackles. And so live here in the sim, we can experience this patient in a non-destructive environment. You can assign grades to it if you want. You may want to, on this patient that we did, there's one thing they really need to do. They need to remove the lower clothes so they can find the infected wound. So you might come into grading and go into assessments and say, you have to do something and it's required. Right. You have to uh, remove, there you go. Remove lower clothes is needed. It is a critical action. You're going to get three points for it. That is now gradable objectively. And so if they, if they go through the SIM without doing this action, it's going to ping them. They're going to, they're going to see a, a, a failure. I'm going to go mm -hmm. back to digital investment here. So we have subject matter experts on our team. They're nurses just like Martha and they, they construct logic. It, it's kind of like an algorithm. This allows you to create something that has if this, then that. So if so, when the bed rail is adjusted, when it's raised, we want to do something. We want to have the system check if it's raised, and then we want to give the student a grade. And so w that's the purpose, right? They, if they don't do it, they don't get the grade. So there's your little logic there. That takes very little time. But what if it's a medication administration? When glucose is administered, and I can click in here and drop down and pick different medications, pick different actions. When glucose is administered, 180 second timer is going to begin. And then we're going to change their glucose levels from 113 to 240. Now, as you can see in this particular sim, it's a simple one. It's glucose 15 milligram pre-dosed tube. So they don't need to put in a dose. They can just administer that tube of glucose. And now... There's this logic. So let's pretend that you spent some time on this. You spent an hour going through this and creating this physiologic response to glucose administration. And you're like, oh, I'm tired. I don't want to have to do that every single time I want to administer glucose to my patients. So then don't. Draw a box around it. 
hit edit copy and paste it into another SIM and it'll run. That's digital investment. That means that what you build, what you create lives on. You're pushing a snowball up a hill, but when it gets to the other side, it just runs. And suddenly when you duplicate a case, you can paste in some glucose logic and you can just make that single learning objective. That case is just going to be about administering glucose to a diabetic patient, period. That's it. All right. We wanted to save. Oh, and thank you, Melissa. Do you have any questions for us? No, thank you. Did that uh, work out how you were expecting? Yeah, it did. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being brave. All right, guys. I, don't my know avatar? I love your avatar. Yeah, brave I with know, your avatar. I like it. She was 2023 20, brave. I like it. So uh, we got about I was gonna... 14 minutes left. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say one more thing, Devin, which is which is another thing that is challenging sometimes when you're a clinical educator and you know we we work really hard on <clears throat> developing and designing simulations for our students and then changing them is difficult and or they they hear through the grapevine even though we tell them that it's we're not supposed to share information about simulations they'll hear okay it's going to be a chest pain and it's going to this is what you're going to need to do it's very very easy to change a few small things in these simulations you could do it between classes between groups between semesters and and then it it's a whole other simulation you put it in a different setting you change a few things and the students will it's it's a whole new experience for them which also can save you a lot of time as an, as an educator we're going to um show some results of the first poll. And I'm going to ask if uh, Regina could send out the second poll in a moment. So which challenge to clinical education affects you most? Time to focus on content, drill down on students, lack of space, standardization, staffing shortages, student buy-in, time, bandwidth, funding. 25% of you agree that time to focus on content and drill down with students is what's affecting you most. Another 17% of you, three tied, 17%, three times, standardization, staffing shortages, student faculty buy-in. The goal is to provide a tool, a solution that is a digital investment that lives on and grows with your institution, that can be sprinkled throughout your curriculum, that allows students an easy, accessible, equitable way to simulate where they are, meet the students where they are, without occupying your time one-to-one -one with a student. If you are always, if you're always tied to the student in order to get them through simulation, you cannot become two people and just suddenly do twice as many students. But that's what's expected of you. And so we want to provide you with a tool that allows you to give access to your students. So they're simulating and providing you with information while you are resting while you are focusing on something else, while you are drilling down with students and spending core time with someone who needs extra attention. Melissa, can you post the next poll for us? And I'd like to just open it up for any questions that anyone has. The next poll that's up is, do you think it would be beneficial to allow students to simulate outside of class? And what I mean by outside of class is not like just at home. I mean, when they're not standing in front of you, it could be while they're at your institution, it just means when they're not standing toe to toe with you, occupying your very valuable and limited time. Yeah, we know often when, in my experience, when I've been doing a simulation day and we might have two or three simulation stations and students are rotating between the simulations or there's there can be downtime, time when we don't really get a chance to actually be doing much content development or content delivery, I should say, where students are just kind of standing around. And so that's a fantastic time to be able to do some of these small simulations, short things to just allow students to stay in that mindset and use use their time without you having to necessarily be right there managing or running things. How are we doing on time, Regina? We're doing good. We have 10 minutes left. Perfect. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to put in the chat? Or if you want to have a conversation, come on board. 
please answer the poll and then we'll check those results um, when when they come in. And I think at this point right now, while we're waiting for people to answer the poll, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit of a story. We had a customer of VR patients go to a conference and they took their enterprise headsets with them. So they had like a box of, um, I think it was 12 headsets. And they actually had to empty out the case for the uh, baby sim mannequin. Um, I see there's a question really quick. Uh, Melissa, you asked if it's customized for IPE, uh, interprofessional education. Is that what that stands for? What's IPE? Forgive my ignorance. Do you know, Martha? I'm not sure well, what Melissa means for sure. Chat it in, Melissa. Help me out with your IPE. So he's at a conference, interprofessional education. Um, yeah. What do you think, Martha? Could you tackle that one? Oh, absolutely. Definitely uh, customizable for <clears throat> interprofessional education, in my opinion. We have have a lot of background in EMS. So there's a lot of really um, excellent opportunities to to set up scenarios where you can have handoffs, um, dialogue with team steps, yes. The, you can customize the dialogue. You can uh, you know, put in lots of responses that you don't want them to pick versus what they should pick. Uh, they can practice SBAR. They can practice a lot of those kind of critical conversations. Um, all of that is entirely designed by the course designer, yeah. the person in charge of the course. Yeah, and I also didn't, I, I was thinking about this. Um, there's like a call-in. So you can have the physician does mm -hmm. call-ins and also family members can call in. So you're in SIM and you're with the patient and suddenly like over the loudspeaker, this doctor calls in and gives you updates or tells you new orders or like a family member calls in and tells you some history about your patient. And suddenly now you're engaging in dialogue with more people on your team. Mm -hmm. And natural language no so a couple of answer a couple of your questions so communication and team steps so the dialogue assessment inter uh, bedside manner communication skills um that is like you could do that all day with this system and just create simulations based on dialogue i really like to use chat gpt for this because it's really good at playing roles and it knows medicine pretty well so uh, certainly at the entry level nursing level so what you can do is you can tell chat that you're gonna you're writing a script and you have two characters and one of them is a nursing uh, is, a, is a nursing patient and they're scared and they're ill and they have a, a respiratory problem or something like that. You tell them the little physiologic scenario that this is this patient. And then you have your second character who is a competent nurse professional. OK. And then you say, I would like you to draft me a script that's like 30 questions and answers back and forth. And it's going to be their initial assessment. And it knows what an initial assessment is hit enter, it gives you a script and you copy and you paste that into VR patients and then you change it, right? You just make adjustments to it. You have this great foundation immediately and it can be in any language. So you can say, I want the patient to be Spanish speaking only and really give your students a challenge. But um, and then you can make changes to it and your dialogue suddenly becomes this bedside manner discussion, but it is not natural language processing. And that is not because we don't want to do it. It is because of a technological barrier. So I want you to imagine that you are in class or your students are somewhere. You don't know where they are. Maybe they checked out a headset. Maybe they're at home and they have brothers and sisters and the TV's on. Or they're at a coffee shop or they're wherever or they're in class and there's multiple students or maybe you're doing it in a sim day. It'd be nice if, if you could control every time a student was in a headset, they were in a quiet space alone, but you can't. Which means that if you're doing a natural language processor and there's a little mic on the headset, it's going to hear everything. And you don't want your student to miss points because they asked about allergies, but the sim didn't pick it up in the natural language processing because there were so many other loud things happening. So because the hardware is not there yet, we have not instituted natural language processing yet. I think the first step inching towards it might be speech recognition, but that's going to be when a, a student reads the wristband and says out loud the name and date of birth of the patient, and then it has to like check that they actually said that. That's different because now the system is just listening for a field, like a text field. That's not natural language processing. So that is more realistic for, per today's hardware limitations. Um, it is controller. It is, hi, Melissa. She's got lots of questions. It is controller-based 
Um, there is a menu. We have lots of wonderful things on our roadmap like hands, but we do things foundationally. So because this sim is not like other simulations, we don't build content for you. We don't, you don't order content from us. You don't order sims. You can have a library of a hundred or a hundred thousand patients and we don't charge you for that. We want you to have a diverse library. That's how you win with your students. We want you to be in control of your patients. That means when we build and construct things, it needs to work on all patients for all users at all stages of the simulation building process. And so today we are approaching hands, but it's still clicking on the menu. And that allows you to objectively assess your students as they go through something. If they don't do it, they don't objectively get assessed for it. And so, um, and then the next iteration is reaching for things and picking up the the medication and when you do that it selects the things in the menu but yes today today it is menu based uh, well it's not fully menu based but in order to do certain actions dialogue um, and select your medications you have to select your medications uh, i just want to i interrupted my story we're going to let that story go basically he trained 40 people in two days by himself on four trauma sims and issued 120 hours of ce's by himself it was amazing Poll number two, the results just came in. Is it screen sharing the results? Can you see them, Martha? Awesome. So I did not expect this. Is there anyone in the chat who could give me a, a response as to why? Why would it be beneficial to you? Uh, it's okay if it's what we... I honestly expected pushback on this one. I expected to be like, nah, not really. <laughs> Maybe some of us. But 10 out of 10? that being able to allow students to simulate outside of the you know official classroom would be v valuable i just that, that is mind boggling to me and and great but what's the core reason is it is it because of staff and time and that's what we've been talking about anyone in the chat want to chime in what was your reason for voting yes on this poll what do you think martha do you have any insights I think most faculty and uh, people are all about empowering students to be able to do some learning on their own and to be able to to go and and seek out information that they want. We are trying very much always, I believe, as nurse educators to try to get students to own some of their own knowledge development and their own practice. Um, mm -hmm. I see Melissa, our friend Melissa. Deliberate just, practice. Yes, deliberate practice. You know, it, it it would be fantastic to be able to have that opportunity. Oh, scaffolding. Mm. Now, is that is that what I'm saying when I say sprinkling? Is that scaffolding? Because I say sprinkle VR simulation throughout your curriculum. But are we talking about like building blocks and, sc and scaffolding? Is that what that means? I think that's what Melissa means. And it's the idea of you build foundations, right? You start out with Oh, it's breaking up the learning into chunks. Get, That's so what that she's talking about. Yeah. Yes. I love that. Uh, you know what? That's an exceptional use of asynchronous education where the students can digest, simulate undigestible chunks and break up the learning. Yeah, I got you there. Thank you for that, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So these, this is our emails. Send us an email. We'd be happy to chat with you, collaborate with you, and see if we can provide you a solution or just talk ideas with you. We would love to. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can check out our podcast that we do, the Immersive Medical Podcast. We actually interviewed the president of Anaxel um, and talked about the results of this. If you guys are all Anaxel members, we gave Anaxel the actual results of like the raw data, the Excel spreadsheet. So... Um, I don't know if Regina has the power to say yes, but I think you should reach out to an Axel and ask them for those results. And uh, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate everyone's time and attention here today. I hope this was valuable to you. And if you need anything, reach out because we are here to support your simulation needs. We're, tr we're really trying to listen to the challenges you're facing and then build you a solution that makes you bigger, faster, stronger. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all for joining today's session. And thank you again to our presenters, Devin and Martha. And we hope to see you all at our next educational offering.
Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. I'll stay on in case someone's shy and they want to stick around. <laughs>